thank you very much. It's great that we have uh, Zoom and we can connect this way. My lab uh, asked a question, can we develop uh, computer uh, programs in order to design uh, better proteins? And especially we're focusing uh, on antibodies, which are special proteins that our body uses in order to fight off uh, infection, including uh, viruses. So for 15 years, I've been in this field of protein design, mostly asking uh, basic research uh, questions. But since this um, uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic started, uh, we diverted or focused all of our efforts in the lab, or most of them, uh, to trying to the best of our uh, abilities um, to help uh, in this uh, fight. So today I won't present anything conclusive. This is very early days for us. This is more of a progress report on these uh, efforts. Um, so probably many of you have seen these really haunting images of the coronavirus. Um, if you look at these images, the name corona actually derives from the way these viruses look. You can see these spikes on the periphery of the virus, these spike proteins. These are actually viral proteins and they're the main villain uh, in this story. Uh, through these spike proteins, uh, the virus can invade the cells that line uh, our lungs. Um, and it is really our attempt here is can we neutralize, can we bind and neutralize uh, these uh, spike proteins. But you can see that these images are much too coarse to get any physical sense of what these uh, spike proteins actually look like. But a month ago, our collaborators at the University of Texas in Austin uh, determined the atomic structure uh, of the spike protein from coronavirus as you see uh, here. This is quite important. Uh, and although this uh, coronavirus is new, uh, we don't actually have to study it from scratch uh, just now because the virus that caused the SARS epidemic of 2003 was very similar. It, it's, it, it's not identical to this coronavirus, but it's very similar uh, to this coronavirus. And through excellent research done over the past 15 or so uh, years, we actually know in quite a bit of detail sites of vulnerability on the surface of the spike protein. These are marked here in yellow and in pink. And what do I mean by these sites of vulnerability? We know that antibodies that bind to just these sites can actually block the process by which the virus uh, enters uh, our lung cells. And that means that they can block uh, also infectivity and protect us against this uh, deadly uh, disease. So the question for us becomes, can we actually design antibodies that would bind just these sites of vulnerabilities? That is not the antibodies that bind just anywhere on the spike protein, but the antibodies that bind specifically to these uh, particular sites. So now you may ask, is it actually possible to design a protein that would bind to a specific site uh, on a virus uh, of interest? So this is taken from work that I did uh, um, about 10 years ago as a postdoc, uh, as Roy mentioned, in the University of Washington in Seattle, where I developed uh, the first methods for designing protein binders. And we use these methods in order to target a different virus, uh, the um, virus that caused the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 and caused the deaths of probably over 50 million people uh, worldwide. So this is the hemagglutinin protein uh, from the Spanish flu uh, pandemic. And just like the coronavirus spike protein, this protein is also known to have uh, vulnerabilities. In one of these is this site uh, shown here. So we used in our methods in order to design proteins that would bind specifically, essentially like a jigsaw puzzle into this site. And you can see they form these sort of fist-like shapes uh, down here. And we show that they actually bound atomically accurately. This was the first demonstration of its sort of proteins designed on the computer that bound in atomic accuracy uh, the sites of interest. They didn't just bind these sites, they actually protected against infection of a diverse uh, range of flu strains, including the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918, uh, uh, av avian flu, and the swine flu uh, pandemic of 2009. Uh, so this was uh, incredibly promising. You may ask, okay, so maybe case closed, maybe we can use exactly the same methods as I had used 10 years ago in order to design uh, proteins that would bind the vulnerabilities on the spike protein. But actually this is not, unfortunately, this is not the case. And this is because these methods had, these methods of 10 years ago had significant shortcomings. I won't explain these in too much detail, but you can just see here uh, that the proteins were suboptimal and they required years of work 
uh, in order to make them optimal. Um, and years of work is simply not acceptable when we're dealing with a pandemic emergency as we are uh, currently. So since starting my lab um, eight years ago, as what you mentioned, um, our, my lab has been focused on developing a different uh, strategy for designing uh, protein functions. Uh, and before I show you that the strategy actually works in addressing some of these challenges that I showed in the previous slide, I'd like to give you a little bit of insight about how we design uh, proteins on the computer and what makes our uh, strategy uh, unique. So we start with uh, um, an atomic structure of the protein of interest. This may be the spike protein from coronavirus. And we design proteins that would bind specifically, we would form uh, as many interactions as possible, as many excellent interactions as possible uh, with this uh, spike protein. And we use physics-based calculations in order to compute uh, these uh, interactions. But what we and others have found over several years of uh, using this paradigm of physics-based calculations is that uh, these calculations on their own are not sufficiently accurate in order to design large and complex proteins uh, such as antibodies. So instead of that, what the, the unique strategy that uh, we've been developing in the lab also uses information from evolution. So you can think of, about it as though evolution is essentially a billions year uh, experiment on proteins. We have many, many different proteins in many, many different organisms in many different uh, conditions. And whatever proteins, whatever structures have survived the evolutionary selection process, uh, these um, uh, selected uh, structures tell us about what can and cannot work uh, in, in, in protein design. And we use this information in order to guide the atomistic design process. Essentially what we have here is a hybrid strategy that uses physics-based calculations in order to compute the physical uh, details of the interactions, uh, but this is uh, driven or guided uh, by evolutionary uh, data. And when we started this, we didn't know what to expect, but what we've seen is that this hybrid strategy actually solves some of the most fundamental and challenging problems of protein uh, design and engineering. And I'll show you just very briefly two examples before returning uh, to coronavirus. The first example has to do with uh, stability design. So many proteins are very unstable. This is specifically a key problem in the development of new vaccines. Uh, because many proteins from uh, viruses or other pathogens, um, um, agents that cause disease, are notoriously uh, unstable. Um, so, for instance, in this project, we turned to a problem from malaria uh, vaccine in, uh, design. Uh, malaria, as you may know, is still a very serious disease. It still causes about half a million deaths uh, per year, mostly of children in developing countries. So it's really a very uh, severe uh, human uh, tragedy. And despite 60 years of research, there's still no effective vaccine uh, for malaria. But about a decade ago, this protein called RH5 was identified as a very exciting potential vaccine uh, against malaria because this protein is absolutely essential for the process by which the malaria parasite uh, invades our red uh, blood cells. But like many other proteins from disease-causing agents, this protein is notoriously unstable. It, it, and, and that means that it cannot be produced cheaply and it doesn't survive high temperatures. And both of these are very serious problems in applying this protein RH5 as a vaccine immunogen. And the reason these are serious problems is that uh, if RH5 actually reaches clinical stage, it will have to be produced in hundreds of millions of doses and then shipped to the poorest countries of the world, let's say in Central Africa, where there is no electricity and therefore no refrigeration. So what we need in order to make RH5 a viable vaccine is a protein that can be cheaply produced, ideally in bacterial uh, cells, and also a protein that can sustain high temperatures while still retaining its protective immunological uh, properties. So we used our strategy, our design strategy, in order to design variants of this uh, RH5 protein. We designed just uh, three variants and recommended them to our collaborators at Oxford University. This sort of blot, I won't take you through all the details, but this sort of blot tells you about the amounts of proteins, the quantities of proteins that bacterial cells can produce of the uh, natural RH5 protein. Don't strain your eyes, there's nothing here to see. Essentially, bacterial cells cannot produce any of this RH5 protein. By contrast, the three designs that we generated on the computer all produce very substantial amounts in bacterial cells, and this means already 
that were likely to reduce the cost of production for this essential uh, future vaccine by at least an order of magnitude. They, our collaborators also tested the heat tolerance of this design. And as you can see, whereas the natural RH5 protein already degrades at about 42 uh, degrees Celsius, uh, the design is stable even beyond uh, four, uh, 50 uh, degrees Celsius. They then injected the design protein and RH5 to mice and tested whether the design still provides uh, protective uh, in, uh, immunological properties. And as you can see, the design is essentially undistinguishable uh, from the wild type, from the um, uh, natural RH5 protein in providing the same levels of protection as the natural uh, protein. So this was a very uh, a compelling proof of principle uh, for using computational uh, protein design in order to improve uh, vaccine immunogens very, very uh, quickly. Obviously, this method is completely automated and we wanted everyone to be able to use it. So it's a very important principle for our lab to develop the methods to the point where anyone in the world uh, can use them efficiently and quickly. So we developed uh, this method into a web server. And over the course of the past four years or so, you can see that it's been used by um, more than thousands of times, more than a thousand different users uh, from around uh, the world. In the context of the coronavirus pandemic, we've already seen several uh, groups use our web server in order to stabilize the spike protein, which I showed earlier, for use as a potential vaccine. Normally, they don't even need our help. They simply log into uh, our web server and use uh, the Weizmann computer uh, cluster in order to design improved spike proteins. But sometimes if our help is needed, we obviously uh, extend it uh, happily. Um, so what I showed you now is uh, how we can stabilize uh, proteins, including vaccine immunogens. Uh, the next question we asked is whether we can also improve uh, proteins activity, therapeutic protein uh, activity. And here we turn to a problem uh, from a nerve agent uh, uh, decontamination. Um, so there is a natural protein called PTE which can break down nerve agents. Uh, these molecules shown here, such as VX, serine, and soman. Nerve agents are some of the most toxic compounds, actually the most toxic compounds we know. And one drop, 10 milligrams, on the skin of an adult can kill within uh, minutes. So there's a lot of interest in developing an effective therapeutic countermeasure to counter nerve agents, which have been used in assassinations, terrorist attacks, and even military conflicts, for, inter for instance, in Syria. Uh, but this natural PTE protein is simply not fast enough. Uh, it's not efficient enough in breaking down uh, these toxic uh, nerve agents. So we designed a few dozen different variants of this PTE enzyme. And I'll show you just the bottom line, just a few um, of, of the best designs uh, that we generated. And what you can see here, these are the design proteins. And on the y-axis, you can see the fold improvement in terms of uh, efficiency in breaking down different uh, nerve agents compared to the natural protein. And you can see that for several of these nerve agents, VX, Oman, and Serene included, we're getting enzymes, designed enzymes with more than 100 and as much as 4,000 fold improved uh, efficiency in breaking them down. This shows the, the activity profile of the designs on the bottom versus the natural enzyme on the top. And you can see that two of these enzymes, especially these two here on the bottom, have a very broad uh, substrate range. They essentially break down all of the nerve agents that we have tested, and they do so at the limit that is required for therapeutic decontamination. So these results were very exciting for us. They, they showed that uh, uh, computational design can achieve uh, these results in a fraction of the time required from state-of-the-art uh, methods. Essentially, we had these, design, um, this, these data uh, about two months after starting uh, this project. And time is very important when you're dealing with a, a pandemic situation because all the state-of-the-art methods currently rely on iterative op optimization methods carried out in the lab, which can last for months and often years. Instead of that, now uh, some of these methods that I've described can actually be uh, used through a web server uh, to provide essentially one-shot automated optimization of protein stability and also of activity. So what I'd like to do now is turn back to the question with which I started this seminar. Can we design uh, antibodies that bind to these vulnerabilities on the coronavirus uh, spike protein and in doing so hopefully neutralize uh, coronavirus uh, infectivity. So I'll show you how this method uh, works. I'll just mention at the beginning 
that we've been thinking about this problem for more than uh, two years, actually, and we've been working on this problem for more than two years. Uh, but um, we obviously didn't have coronavirus in mind when we started this. This started as a basic research uh, question, fundamental research question about how to design antibodies that bind uh, desirable uh, sites. But since this corona pandemic started, we obviously focused our efforts on this uh, key problem. So I'll show you how this technique uh, works. Uh, we start with computational uh, modeling. Let's say we have uh, the viral uh, protein and the target site shown here um, in cyan. This can be these vulnerabilities on the spike protein. And we design, again on the computer, um, different uh, uh, shapes of antibodies that would bind to this uh, target site. And we do this millions and millions of times, isolating maybe the top dozen or so uh, antibodies that have the best uh, shape complementarity for this uh, target site. Um, and we don't just stop uh, here. We don't just stop with these uh, dozen or so uh, different antibody, uh, computed antibodies. Around each of these antibody leads, as we call them, we compute 100,000 uh, different variants, different mutants, slightly different structures that bind the specific target site, but with a slightly different structure um, and, and, and potentially provide us with an added affinity and specificity uh, for this target site. The end result of this process is a million to 10 million uh, different unique antibodies, all of them optimized to bind this uh, specific target site. So all of this is done on the computer. Now we go to the lab and actually synthesize uh, these antibodies in the test tube. And we use what's known as high throughput screening, essentially an experimental framework that enables us to test in the test tube whether we can bind uh, the uh, coronavirus spike protein uh, using these millions and millions of antibodies, essentially in one uh, single experiment. So this is one experiment that gives us information on the binding affinity of each of these millions and millions of antibodies to the spike uh, protein. So coming back to this problem of the coronavirus uh, spike protein, and can we design binders of these specific uh, vulnerabilities? I mentioned at the start of my talk that coronavirus spike uh, really challenges us more than the influenza hemagglutinin protein uh, that I targeted uh, during my postdoc. Why is that? Um, as you see here, these um, uh, molecules shown here in orange, these are sugar molecules. And the virus uses these sugar molecules in order to coat itself and to protect itself against binding by antibodies. It's very difficult for antibodies to bind such uh, uh, sugar-coated uh, molecules as you see here. So the problem for us is not just to bind to these sites of vulnerabilities, it's to bind these sites of vulnerabilities while dodging uh, this uh, sugar coating. And this is a, a, an especially difficult uh, problem. And when starting this project, I wasn't exactly sure uh, that our methods were up to the task, but fortunately we've seen over the past month of, or so of working on this problem, uh, quite a few uh, leads that seem quite promising. This is shown here. These are just two of the four million or so uh, lead antibodies that we've designed using the method I showed uh, earlier. This shows some atomic detail on these, and you can see that the antibody essentially hugs uh, this site of vulnerability uh, on the spike protein, providing what we predict uh, would be high affinity and specific uh, binding. So while I'm optimistic about this, um, this, I, I, I assume, will take a lot of effort and we need many, many more uh, such antibodies in order to, to obtain a high affinity and specific uh, binder. So we're not stopping with this. Actually, tomorrow we're hoping to launch uh, these same calculations, not our, on the Weizmann uh, supercomputer, but on several other supercomputers, one in Switzerland, for instance, another uh, on Amazon cloud services, and hopefully also on uh, Google. Um, and this is uh, also, I should, I should mention also the experimental uh, track has been going on in parallel. We, today we obtained uh, the spike protein from our collaborators at the University of Texas in Austin. Um, and we've started synthesizing uh, the 4 million or so uh, antibodies. I think that we'll um, complete this process already this week and we'll start uh, screening these millions of antibodies as early as next week. Uh, this is a very good time to also mention how inspiring it is to see how the entire scientific community is coming together and collaborating with one another, uh, because this is really a problem for all of us, and we're trying to do our best. Everybody's trying to do uh, their best in order to help uh, everyone else. It's also a good time to mention 
uh, all the people who are actually doing uh, the work on this. These, these are four excellent uh, students uh, in the lab. Um, and before I close, I'd like to mention just one more uh, point. Many people, and you've probably seen this in, in um, opinion pieces in papers, many people are comparing this coronavirus pandemic uh, to the Spanish flu pandemic, which as I mentioned, caused tens of millions of deaths a uh, hundred years ago. But I think that we should be more positive uh, than this um, and not fear uh, this pandemic as much because as Susan mentioned, um, science and technology are way uh, better uh, today than they were for our uh, grandparents. And all of the um, aspects, methodological aspects and molecular aspects, which I showed you in this presentation today, were simply not possible to achieve as, as you know, even five uh, years ago. So there is good reason for concern, uh, of course. This is a very serious pandemic, but there's also good reason for optimism. We need to work hard, uh, but there's good reason for optimism. Um, I'd like to close here, uh, thanking my group members, uh, collaborators, the Schweitzer and Sherman families for their support, and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Sorel. We have a lot of questions. Science gives us a lot of hope, and, and listening to you certainly um, uh, gives us a lot of information, um, uh, which is really important at this time and hope. So I'll start reading some of the questions. Uh, please ask Sorel about the news regarding the potential efficacy of the malaria drug chloroquine in treating COVID-19. Yeah, so um, I'm not an expert on these uh, matters, but uh, of what I know about uh, chloroquine um, is that the expected mechanism of action uh, or what people think is the mechanism of action of chloroquine against uh, the coronavirus is that uh, it inhibits, it also inhibits the process by which the virus invades uh, our lung cells by changing the pH uh, within our lung cells. Um, so it's, it's a fairly drastic uh, approach um, to a therapeutic. Uh, the therapy, what's known as the therapeutic window, what is the concentration of the drug that is effective on the one hand that actually can change the pH within our cells without risking our lives, without causing severe side effects, et cetera. Those are uh, significant questions, um, which I, I don't know if they're uh, completely understood at this point. Um, it's, a, it's a good, this is an excellent question, not only because of chloroquine in itself, but also because there are numerous other uh, either technologies or molecules out there that people are now trying to apply uh, to this coronavirus uh, problem. Um, uh, molecules that have been useful, apparently useful uh, in other viruses or even as, uh, as chemotherapeutics against cancer are being tested right now. Also immune modulatory molecules are being tested. Um, th this is one of the reasons why there's again reason to be optimistic. People in Italy, in the hospitals in Italy, are again constantly sharing information about what they've tested uh, in the terrible situation that they have uh, over there um, and what may uh, work. So I think things are moving very, very quickly. There were some articles also about combining it with an uh, antiviral uh, drug that's currently used for HIV. Other articles talking about combining it with zithromycin. Um, so, uh, just any uh, com final comment on that before we move to the next question? People are trying whatever they have that makes any sense. And again, my optimism comes from the fact that people are sharing um, almost with no borders. And, and that's a very unique situation uh, for science. Science often happens, um, takes time, right? Because we each do our work and only when we're sure that something actually works do we publish it. Um, and, and this process of slow verification may not be um, the best fit for what is needed now. And people are simply breaking down uh, these barriers. They're no longer waiting for journals uh, to publish their papers. They, they're just posting the papers online as soon as they have anything. Uh, and this is incredibly uh, useful. Thank you. Next question, can you comment on immunity from having had it once? Um, it's, it's, a really, it's a really important question again. The, this is, um, the question here is whether getting uh, the virus just once protects us long term against a similar infection uh, in the future. Um, we expect that this will be uh, the case. In the case of 
um, for instance, the Spanish flu pandemic, this started again in 1918. Uh, um, and for a few years, this, this, this type of flu uh, was prevalent in all human uh, societies. Um, later on, because uh, humanity uh, um, obtained what's known as herd uh, immunity, everybody became uh, almost protected against uh, that particular strain of the flu, the flu had to mutate, change its uh, shape in order to, be, to adapt to uh, our antibodies. And in doing so, um, we still got ill, but this is what is known now as the seasonal flu, which is far less deadly uh, than the, the Spanish flu pandemic, because as the virus mutates, it also becomes less infective. So even if corona, there's data that show that corona is mutating, but even if the, the coronavirus does mutate, um, its infectivity is likely to be significantly uh, lower uh, than the, the strain that's currently uh, circulating. So even if it does mutate, my expectation, and, and I think most of the experts' expectation, is that um, um, immunity in the future will be substantial to this uh, coronavirus. Thank you. And the next question is, uh, how do you determine which site on the spike protein is a good target? Yeah, um, excellent question again. Um, I mentioned that there was about 15 years of research on SARS um, and we have, SARS was a much more deadly uh, uh, disease than uh, this current coronavirus. It caused approximately 30% uh, mortality among those who were infected. And this is one of the reasons why SARS actually did not get out of hand. It simply killed uh, people uh, very, very quickly compared to this uh, new coronavirus. But what happened during the process of this infection is that obviously people survived and we can study the antibodies uh, that these people produced. And if you look at the structures of the antibodies that these people, the survivors of the SARS epidemic, uh, these antibodies and, and what surfaces they targeted on the SARS um, uh, spike protein, you can see just that surface that I showed in the first slide of my seminar. This is how we know um, what's, what surfaces to target on this new uh, coronavirus spike protein. It's, it's, um, this is an essential point, by the way, because if we had to wait um, for antibodies from survivors, we still don't have those uh, at hand. And then structurally characterizing those, this could take years, uh, sorry, months or even years uh, in some cases to do. So we're, we're really much more advanced than we would be if it weren't for that uh, excellent research done over more than a decade. Next question, if SARS and Corona are similar, uh, SARS did not come back in 2012, while we hear coronavirus may come back um, in subsequent years. Can you comment on that? We don't yet know whether coronavirus, this new coronavirus will come uh, every year. Um, it's, it's an open question. Uh, one of the reasons people uh, think SARS did not uh, reemerge is because it was so uh, deadly um, and its incubation time in humans was uh, shorter uh, than the new coronavirus. These are, you know, these um, specific details about uh, how a virus, um, what is the incubation time in an individual? How long is this individual infected before that individual actually shows symptoms? Um, how many people does this individual infect before he becomes uh, quarantined, um, et cetera, et cetera. These are very, very important parameters uh, as you study each and every uh, specific virus. And, and these are also the differences between, for instance, uh, seasonal flu and the Spanish flu pandemic. Uh, there, there may be minor differences on the surface of the spike protein in the case of corona or the hemagglutinin protein in the case of influenza, but these minor molecular differences can make a huge difference in terms of the epidemiology uh, of the disease. And, and some of them are, are, are not yet understood in the case of the coronavirus. Another question, is your research about a cure or a vaccine? Um, also a very good uh, question. I mentioned um, at one point of my talk that people are making use of our uh, web servers in order to design a better, potentially a better vaccine for coronavirus, which is very exciting, but we're essentially not, we don't, we don't need to be involved in that. Uh, the antibodies that we design, they may have, they, they, if, if they work, um, obviously once we have uh, validated binders for those sites, we'll send them to our collaborators to verify that these antibodies can actually neutralize virus infectivity. If that happens, then yes, this will become uh, a platform for developing a future uh, treatment 
uh, for coronavirus. They can also uh, be useful for developing and verifying vaccine. Um, and the reason for that is that if we know that the, the antibodies bind to a specific neutralizing surface uh, on this spike protein, when people are developing a new vaccine, they're doing this without the use of antibodies, they're doing it sort of in the dark. They, they, they don't actually know, they're producing the proteins, but they don't actually know that the protein would provoke the same immunological response as uh, the natural um, uh, coronavirus spike protein. If you have such an antibody, you can very, very quickly verify that the protein you produced in the lab, uh, you designed in the lab, let's say, uh, is actually, will actually provide uh, protective immunity uh, against uh, um, the coronavirus infection. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a dual use uh, design project. Great. Um, another question. I understand there may be two distinct critical target sites on COVID-19 that bind to human cells. Will it be necessary to design proteins for both in order to be effective? I, I showed just one uh, of the vulnerabilities. Um, I, I actually focused on the vulnerabilities that are conserved among the, this new coronavirus and the SARS epidemic of 2003. And the reason for focusing on these vulnerabilities is that if we get uh, proteins that bind them, then we may have a general, what's known as a universal, uh, treatment for coronaviruses. Um, in parallel to that, there's a region, it's called the domain of the spike protein. Uh, it's the receptor binding domain. Some of you may know ACE2, which is a human protein that's a human receptor uh, that binds to the spike protein. Um, this receptor binding domain um, is not so highly conserved among coronavirus uh, strains. Uh, but it's, it is also a site of vulnerability for this particular strain. And since this strain is so important, we're also targeting uh, this particular site. So we're actually not targeting only that site I showed uh, before, we're targeting also uh, the receptor binding site. Another question, what is the timeline from computational development to clinical testing? And is it possible or wise to fast track this process? In the case of the malaria vaccine, uh, which I showed uh, earlier, um, that was very fast. Um, I don't remember if it was months or maybe a year and a half or so, but it was, it was very, very fast. Um, in the case of something like coronavirus, we're, we're essentially in uncharted territory. Um, I, I can't say, uh, but once people have um, what seems to be a viable treatment, what does this mean? So essentially you show uh, proof first in, in cell culture, that means human cells and virus, and you try to block uh, viral entry into these cells. If you show that this succeed, succeeds, you then go into animal studies. Uh, this is a bit tricky because there are no uh, model animals uh, for studying coronavirus just yet. People are working on this, but there's no such model system uh, just yet. If you show something like this, then you have enough proof to go into uh, clinical studies. And I'm quite sure um, that in the if the situation persists where there's no uh, potential treatment just yet, I'm, I'm pretty sure that this would be um, incredibly fast track. Thank you. Another question, what is your opinion on how coronavirus started? Um, my opinion is that it wasn't uh, uh, a military uh, experiment of any sort. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we know actually that uh, we have sequencing data um, coronaviruses from different animals. You may have heard about uh, bats. Um, there's currently a uncertainty about whether this emerged directly from bats or from uh, these armadillo-like, very cute um, pangolins. I forget the name, but I think it's, it's called pangolin. Um, the sequence identity between the circulating, the currently circulating coronaviruses and these uh, coronaviruses uh, in bats and in pangolins is very, very high. It's, it's very clear uh, that this came from uh, these animal sources. Uh, there's good information that this came from some sort of food markets in China, etc. I, I wouldn't treat these, um, uh, I, I, would, I would consider them rumors. Uh, these um, notions that this may have emerged from some um, military lab of some sort, uh, yeah. 
Thank you. Can you please give more details about the computational techniques that you use in order to find different antibodies? So bear in mind when you answer this, Sorel, that most of us are non-scientists. So yes. I'm a little worried about you answering that question. Not going to lie. Yeah. Um, so if we have another hour and a half, <laughs> um, I, I can do this very briefly. You know, but uh, the, the basic idea is that we have um, um, computational methods uh, which enable us to model each and every atom um, of the spike protein in the computer. So we have the coordinates for each and every atom on the spike protein. We also have the atomic coordinates of about 400 uh, different antibodies uh, that have been deposited through years and years of efforts by the entire scientific community uh, in a database. And we can take these 400 or so uh, different antibodies. We then, our computer programs enable us to do what's known as docking. We essentially uh, bring the two structures together, the antibody on the one hand and spike protein on the other, and we change the conformation ever so slightly of the antibodies versus the spike protein. And for each such new conformation, we measure the interaction, what's known as the interaction energy. We essentially count the number of atomic interactions uh, between the spike protein and the antibody. And we can sculpt, we don't only dock the protein, the, the antibody, we also can sculpt it, meaning that we can mutate it, change its uh, structure in order to improve its binding. So we're not just taking antibodies from nature, we're actually changing them. We're mutating them to form the best fit against the spike protein. Um, and that's in a very, you know, in a nutshell, uh, the process that we're uh, carrying uh, out here. This, this really takes, I mean, I, I can do this, but uh, uh, it will take uh, a fairly long time to explain the chemistry and physics behind this. Have any of the tests mentioned, uh, for example, regarding suppression of nerves, nerve agents been conducted in vivo? The nerve agents, as far as I'm aware, were conducted also in vivo in a follow-up study, not in our lab. Next question. Is it possible to know how they produce thousands of engineered antibodies, at which speed, and how they can select those that work in a single experiment? <laughs> uh, yes, I, I sort of... Uh, glanced over this because it's again it's a lot of technical uh, detail it took us um, the better part of two years uh, to develop this into uh, to the point where it now takes us really on the order of a week to three weeks uh, to assemble the, the genetic pieces and then to screen them experimentally um, there are over the past I, I, you know over the past 40 years or so people have been developing increasingly more sophisticated uh, methods for genetic cloning. Um, you may have been, you may have heard about uh, genetic cloning in a variety of different uh, contexts in health, um, in synthetic biology, and other uh, different contexts. But there are many, many different tools uh, for piecing small pieces of DNA together in order to generate uh, full length, uh, let's say, antibody sized uh, genes. And this is essentially what we're doing. We're um, synthesizing small pieces of DNA, which we can then combine in the test tube to generate full length uh, antibody sized uh, pieces. Um, this is, um, again, it, on paper it sounds, it's, it's easy to explain. Um, on, in practice, it took us again, the better part of two years uh, to develop this uh, to the point where now it, it's, it's indeed a week or two uh, to synthesize them. Okay, now for the screening part. So once we have the antibodies um, encoded in genes, so you probably know that um, genes encode for proteins, right? Each triplet of DNA encodes for an amino acid. Um, so once we have this, we transform. This means we inject uh, the DNA into yeast cells. Uh, the yeast cells then become antibody production factories. Each specific um, yeast cell will produce uh, one uh, specific designed antibody and put it on its surface. It will coat its surface uh, with our designed uh, antibodies. Uh, that means that we can now use, this, let's say, the spike protein. We label it with a fluorescent molecule. This can be like a, a marker, like a yellow marker, uh, a fluorescent molecule. So now the spike protein is fluorescent. The yeast cells um, contain our antibodies. And now when we incubate uh, the yeast cells with the spike protein, uh, in a single test tube, we can have about 10 million or 100 million different E cells, different variants of our antibodies. And then we can use what's known as a, a micro, microfluidic device in order to detect 
uh, which yeast cell uh, binds tightly to the fluorescent molecule, to the spike protein. Um, this process uh, takes, um, can, this microfluidic device can take about 10,000 different yeast cells per second, which shows you that within a few hours, uh, we can do an experiment on 10 million uh, different uh, designed uh, antibodies. This is really, uh, in a nutshell again, uh, oh, the technique. Thank you. Um, next question. Uh, it seems to me that the uh, Weizmann Institute um, because of it being basic research and multidisciplinary is uniquely positioned to make a major impact um, in this research. Can you comment? I, I think this is a, a very uh, true. The, um, we mentioned this uh, at the start, where we're, you know, every public institution in Israel is now undergoing a, a, a shutdown, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, we've, we've really been blessed here with uh, support from everybody involved. So for instance, whenever we say that there's this coronavirus that we're working on, um, this has opened the way to uh, recruitment of uh, new uh, people from the IT department so that they can help us to launch these um, uh, very time consuming and computationally uh, resource intensive um, design uh, project on the Amazon cloud, for instance, and on different supercomputers around the world. Uh, without that help, we'd simply be stuck. Um, we've also uh, been able to ask for people, essential uh, personnel to help us in this. And there are so many people around campus that know a lot about uh, viral infections and developing small molecule treatments. You may have heard about Neil London's work and Ron Diskin's work. Uh, we're trying to collaborate with whomever we can uh, in order to um, make these uh, breakthroughs. Yes, so this is absolutely true. This environment is unique. Listening to you, uh, in addition to giving us lots of information, provides us with hope. And we're all rooting for you and your colleagues to get us through this. Um, I also want to thank everyone for joining us. We have among all of the people uh, joining us, the members of the Switzer family and the Sherman family who uh, are uh, certainly uh, very proud of uh, the work you're doing, uh, as we all are. Uh, thank you, Roe, uh, Ro for, for what you're doing and, and the Weizmann Institute management. Thank you to my team for working tirelessly to help make sure that this event happened. Um, and uh, we encourage all of you to stay connected through social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and most importantly, help share good information across your networks and check the websites regularly. Most importantly, we're sending warm wishes for good health to all of you and all of your loved ones. Thank you so much.